everyone, and welcome back to Coast Connections from home. Today, we're here with part two of our interview to commemorate the 75th anniversary of VE Day, the end of World War II in Europe. And war is always a million shades of tragic loss and heartbreak, but it can also be a million shades of tender love and passionate romance. Today, we're gonna to talk about the 48,000 war brides and their children who joined us here in Canada after World War II. And joining us today, we have back from Halifax, from the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, we have Mr. Jan Raska joining us today. Hello, Thanks Jan. How are Thanks. things in Halifax? Great, uh, we have awesome weather, so spring has definitely arrived. We like to hear that. And of course, the Pier um, 21 is still closed because of the uh, pandemic. So we're hoping we can connect viewers virtually with the museum during this time as well. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about um, our Canadian forces in, during World War II and uh, how many of our troops went through Pier 21. Uh, just want a little bit of background. Canada's population at the time in 1939 was only uh, 10 million. And by the end of the war, we had 1.1 million um, soldiers, uh, servicemen and women serving. And it was the largest volunteer army in the world. About 95% were volunteer, weren't they? Some conscription near the end. So that's very impressive. It is. What's really interesting uh, for us as a, a national historic site and a national museum is the, the Pier 21 in Halifax as a major um, allied base in the Battle of the Atlantic, for example, and of course throughout the Second World War, is that uh, nearly 400,000 Canadian servicemen left Canada through Pier 21 uh, to serve on the European front. So for us, we're not only an immigration museum, but the Second World War and military history uh, to that effect also plays a big part of what needs to be remembered and also what we need to cherish as well. And Yen, of those 400,000 um, that went through Pier 21 and the 1.1 million that served, um, about 45,000 of those never came home again. And I think that's very important to remember to all the Canadians that we did lose during this time. But we also want to talk about the good news here about all the Canadians that came home with uh, brides and grooms during that time, which was uh, sort of a military effort, uh, military issue at the time, wasn't it? To how do we deal with this? Because uh, it was the first time in the Canadian Army that women served in uniform and were shipped overseas as well. So it wasn't only just war brides that came back, but some of the service women actually came back with husbands too. That's right. And to sort of set the, the context, in the first couple of years after the end of the war, uh, Canada's gates, for the most part, were actually closed to immigrants. There wasn't a lot of transatlantic um, passage. It wasn't safe. There weren't... Uh, Europe was essentially uh, destroyed. And so for this war bride movement and, of course, war grooms to come to Canada was um, was sort of beside the, the norms of, of the times. And, for example, if we look at the war grooms, we don't know as much about them as we do with the war brides and, and their children, partly because it was Canadian women marrying uh, foreign allied servicemen. And so a lot of those documents and statistics are actually held by foreign governments. And so it's been very hard for researchers here to come across uh, and to find uh, numbers as to how many uh, marriages there were, how many children, uh, mm -hmm. what were the nationalities of some of the men um, that had married Canadian women. What we do know, for example, is that a lot of the Canadian women met these men already in Canada. They had come over to train as pilots during the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And so you would have had Poles and Norwegians and Czechs and Slovaks come over to learn how to fly and then be stationed in England to help uh, keep uh, Britain basically uh, free from allied or, excuse me, a Nazi incursion. And so what you end up having is a whole set of, of different nationalities marrying Canadian women. And a lot of them actually chose to resettle in Canada with their Canadian wives after the war. On the flip side, with the, the war brides and their children, we do know quite a bit about them because in this case, they, of course, were, were, um, were allied. They were non-Canadian and they had married Canadian servicemen in England, in Netherlands, all over, essentially all over the world, actually. Yeah, it wasn't just uh, British war brides that we'll be talking about. So you're right, there was quite a diverse group that came back. 
So um, just a bit of perspective too about the, uh, the age of our servicemen and women. Um, the average age uh, was what, about 26 years old, but um, almost 700,000 of them were under the age of 21. That's right. So they were quite they were quite young, and you do have instances, of course, where you have um, teenagers, sixteen year olds, seventeen year olds, enlisting because they come from a small town, or everybody in their family has has been in the Allied war effort, or their friends had enlisted, and so they didn't want to be left behind. But there was also a stigma at that time in Canadian society: is if you were able bodied and you were healthy mentally and physically, why wouldn't you? help by by enlisting right and so those who who decided not to there was a lot of opposition a lot of uh mistrust and and sort of these sorts of of individuals unfortunately were seen as as disloyal to the allied cause to the war effort mm. so you get all these very fit healthy strapping um young canadians over there in the prime of their life and they're training in the uk for a great deal of the war and they're meeting up with uh, the local women. So obviously, Mother Nature is going to take her, her course here, and uh, they're going to meet up and um, be in the throes of some wonderful love stories throughout the war. So how do we bring these uh, grooms and their brides back home is where we're going to talk about a little bit today. But let's just take a peek at some of these uh, war brides and grooms. We've got some lovely photos here that you've provided from Pier 21, as well as the um, CanadianWarBrides.com and a few other sources. So first we've got this wonderful picture of this uh, bomber squad, these Lancaster pilots, big, strong, healthy, strapping men, and another image of a typical uh, British uh, young lass. <laughs> and you put the two of them together and you end up with Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> Rod and Winifred Mackenzie. And here they are, ages 20 and 26. Here they are, they got married in the UK um, in 1943. And it happens to be the parents of my next door neighbor. So there's many, many Canadians who have uh, stories of war brides right there in their neighborhoods. And um, Jan, like you'll note, she's wearing a beautiful uh, white wedding gown. Um, in our next photo, we've got a, a lady who's in a purple suit. Uh, not everybody could afford a wedding gown or chose a wedding gown. Uh, this particular picture, the lady with the uh, the purple suit, she's wearing a very typical uh, silver horseshoe that she has in her arm. It was for good luck at the time. A really pretty picture there. And that's a couple from, um, uh, he was from Scotland, and that's Kathy and Glenn Elliott who got married there. And the next picture that we have, I really like this shot. This is uh, an English bride named Doris, and she's so happy to have her soldier home again. She doesn't really care about his missing leg, obviously. And she married a French Canadian sweetheart and moved to Montreal, where they had a long and happy marriage. And again, Doris is carrying a silver paper horseshoe for luck, which was common among war brides. A lovely shot, I love that one. And I like this uh, colorized version too. We're not quite sure who this couple is, but I just love the shot of the uh, the very radiant smiles that they have. Very typical of the 40s uh, photography. And of course, we've got to have a guy in a kilt. <laughs> and here we have Eswin Lister. She was one of the very first war brides uh, brought back to Canada when she married Stu Lister uh, in his kilt. And of course, it wasn't only just grooms in that were in uniform. Here's Ernie and Joan Howe of Cambridgeshire, England. They were both in the armed forces when they married in October 1942. So we have a very wide variety of uh, wedding uh, gear uh, here as well. But one, tell us a bit about the parachute silk. Sure. Um, so one of the great things with uh, the collection at the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 is that we have a lot of different stories of Canadian servicemen having, uh, uh, you know, left from the pier to serve overseas, also coming back, and then of course the the war brides and the children that came back. And one of the things that, that I find particularly striking is in a lot of these situations, um, the story of how they, uh, the encounter of how man meets woman is oftentimes told, you know, sort of with a slightly salty attitude or voice, uh, sometimes with a sense of humor, because of course these were, were dire times. For example, for, for British war brides, a lot of the young men uh, left to serve in Europe and in the Pacific, 
And so there weren't a lot of young men to choose from necessarily. You also had um, a lot of allied uh, personnel, for example, like the Canadians, who were seen as exotic and foreign, but also very similar. They came from a British Commonwealth country. They spoke English. Some of them were Francophone, but could, could converse in English as well. And the times, there's a lot of scarcity. There's a lot of rationing. And so here comes a young, a young buck, if you will, who's being paid has obviously um, an, a job, employment, and could essentially provide for her, uh, was seen as something uh, attractive. And you have women meeting men at dance halls, in pubs, perhaps at church services. Uh, we have stories, for example, of a gentleman crashing his bike into a, a young woman's uh, front yard, and she came out and sort of helped him back onto his bike. and they fell in love. In other cases, we have a Canadian serviceman who crashed his bike rather fortunately into a group of, of British nurses. And so he had uh, quite the, the, the choice, I suppose, and, and so, did, so did they. Um, so you have all sorts of, of uh, different stories. And of course, oftentimes, if there weren't enough um, textiles or materials to, ma to make a dress, we do also have stories of Canadian servicemen writing back to their families and asking, can you send a dress? Or can you send any sort of materials, socks? Can you send uh, shoes? Uh, my bride doesn't have any of these things. Uh, for example, we have a, another story where a war bride actually knew how to sew a dress. And so she actually made the, the bridesmaid dresses for the girls in her party. So people were of all different backgrounds, of all different uh, skills and occupations and trades, used their knowledge in a time of scarcity to kind of put a wedding together, right? If they didn't have a yeah. lot, they made, they made it work, essentially. Mm -hmm. And there is a story of uh, one of the uh, the pilots who his parachute saved his life. He actually didn't have a ring to propose to his sweetheart, but he rolled up his parachute and presented that to her as the, uh, the, the, the during the proposal. And then she turned some of that parachute silk into uh, right. a wedding dress. And some of these dresses are still in museums in, uh, I think there's actually a couple in the Smithsonian even, because they were quite a uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, innovation during the war. Lovely story. Especially if the paratrooper, you know, crashed into your haystack in the south of France. <laughs> and we have actually one of those, those dresses that was made out of, partly out of um, uh, parachute materials in our, our Pier 21 gallery. And so mm -hmm. you can come by and, and visit it and see sort of what essentially it took to make. But to be honest, it actually looks like a really great wedding dress. You couldn't really wow. tell. So if you had the skills and I guess the design uh, and you're willing to put it together, um, you could make great things out of all sorts of different materials. Yeah, and you've provided us with some really lovely historical footage here taken by the Canadian Army and fil uh, Film and Photo Unit, who we featured in our first episode. We're going to take a look at this film. It's about one minute and 30 seconds, but it talks about moving the war brides and their children, 48,000 war brides, 22,000 children from uh, Europe and the UK to Canada. Another party of Canadian servicemen's wives and kiddies are off to their new homes across the sea. By boat train, they leave London for the port of embarkation. Since 1939, some 24,000 British girls have married Canadians. 3,000 of them already have been sent to Canada by the Department of Immigration. Young sons and daughters of the Dominion will grow up in the Canadian way of life for which Daddy is fighting on many a shell-torn field. On arrival at the port, everybody is safely stowed aboard the ship which will take them on their long journey. Members of the British Red Cross give valuable assistance during all phases of the move. Johnny Canuck Jr. wonders if it isn't time for eats. So it's a way to a new life in the land of opportunity. To her new citizens, Canada extends the hearty hand of welcome. Yeah, and that's a really interesting uh, piece of film there. Um, talk to us about the narration of that. It's kind of over the top. 
<laughs> sure. It's it's said, of course, during the war, 1944. And what's interesting to me as a historian of, of immigration is that 1944 is when the Department of National Defense actually takes over the responsibility for the repatriation of Canadian servicemen and what they called soldiers' dependents. So these would have been war brides and their children. And what's really interesting is the issue really didn't come to a fore until 1941, 1942, when you have diplomats, for example, our high commissioner in London, Vincent Massey, who later becomes uh, a governor general of Canada, um, saying, well, we have a lot of our, our warships are coming back to Canada empty after bringing personnel over. What if we could bring back some injured Canadian servicemen and some of their, their wives if they had actually married over overseas in the United Kingdom? And you have the immigration branch and the Department of National Defense sort of bickering about, well, what would that look like? What's the minimum that we actually have to uh, provide for not only our, our service personnel, but of course for the women and their children? And one of the ideas bandied about is sort of a minimum, uh, a minimum cost passage. So uh, the wives and their children, of course, wouldn't have to pay for the, the rail, railway to, for example, the Port of Liverpool to meet their ship. They wouldn't have to pay for the transatlantic voyage. And of course, they wouldn't have to pay for the train across Canada. The food on board would be provided for them. Immigration officials were a little hesitant because they saw that the numbers were, uh, during the war years, were increasing. A lot of men were, were, being, uh, were getting married to British women and later to French, to Belgian, to Dutch, and, and so on. And they wondered about the burden of care and the burden of cost. And so eventually in 1944, an order in council was passed by the federal government that gave the responsibility for repatriation to the Department of National Defense. So the military essentially got to take care of its own, and uh, part of its own were actually the soldiers' dependents, the war brides and, and their children. And so beginning in 1942, up until 1948, when, when the program, the repatriation and the movement was considered uh, terminated or concluded, you had over uh, approximately 44,000 women and over 20,000 children come to Canada. And what's really interesting about that is you'll see in a lot of publications the, the number, and, and you mentioned it as well, the 48,000, is oftentimes that number is for marriages, right? And, and sometimes it gets conflated with marriages equaling two people, so a soldier and a bride. But what we've discovered is that there was a, a bit of bigamy that took place. So oftentimes a soldier would quickly rush off and marry a woman and then realize that wasn't what he wanted or it wasn't what she wanted or different circumstances led them to kind of, for that relationship to disintegrate. And before uh, the, both of them were divorced, the soldier had actually gone and married somebody else. Hence the number, you know, hence the number of uh, 40, 48,000 marriages versus only 43,000 uh, war brides or 44,000 war brides coming to Canada. And so there were essentially a few more marriages and, and weddings taking place then there were actually uh, men. So the ratio is a little skewed there. Yeah, a lot going on during their uh, free time, <laughs> which That's is right. good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> now, Jan, they made their uh, crossing across the Atlantic on, on these ships, um, not luxurious cruise ships by any means. And the crossing was, what, about 10 to 14 days, um, depending on conditions at the time. It would have been pretty rough to, you know, have your children with you, your babies, your infants, and coming to a new country. The first time they stepped foot on Canadian soil would have been there at Pier 21. Who was there to greet them, and what was that process like for these women and children coming through Pier 21 in Halifax? Sure. So from 1942 to 1948, of course, you have tens of thousands of, of women and, and their children making that transatlantic voyage, oftentimes, as you mentioned, you know, taking a week, week and a half to two weeks, there was seasickness, uh, there was loneliness, There's, there was the, the questioning of what have I done? Will I see my family back in continental Europe or the United Kingdom again? But they were, of course, uh, being brought, repatriated as desirable Canadians, as desirable residents, as desirable citizens. And so they were, of course, met at Pier 21 with a bit of fanfare. Pier 21 during the war years was, of course, under uh, military authority. And so the embarkation transit unit working in collaboration, for example, 
with the Canadian Wives Bureau, the Women's Auxiliary Corps, and uh, voluntary service agencies, the big one in, in this particular case being the Red Cross, really sort of put out the, the welcome mat for the women and sort of made sure that they were taken care of on ship. And then when they actually disembarked, sort of helped them through uh, the immigration process at Pier 21, which would have been a quick medical check to make sure um, that they didn't appear sick or didn't get didn't uh, get sick during the transatlantic uh, voyage to Canada, and of course a quick uh, civil interview to make sure that their they had their travel documentation that they had their um, their uh, letters of vaccination from a doctor and then of course uh, a customs check to make sure they weren't bringing any foreign plants meats uh, cigarettes mm -hmm. alcohol uh, contraband or dutiable items and that sort of thing mm -hmm. and. Um there was uh, some, we have a couple photos of some interesting resources that were given to them at the time. Um, Dock to Destination was one of the pamphlets that they got. I love the uh, 40s artwork on these. <laughs> and it was nice to know that Canada was so welcoming and really did help them, um, you know, with their transit. Uh, a lot of them had very long train rides then across the country to their destinations. It must have been a very hard transition for some of them, I would think. Uh, their husbands hadn't yet joined them. So they, some of them would be coming a little bit later. But um, did these marriages always work out? I believe Peggy O'Hara, who's written about the war brides, sort of cites approximately 10% uh, mm -hmm. return. And in, in some of those cases, the reason given um, by the authorities was essentially mental, mental collapse, right? or mental distress, which is, I guess, uh, a term of or a sign of the times where um, it could have been stress, it could have been, uh, you know, they're assuming that there was a mental condition. But a lot of the times, especially if these, these women had married men who'd come from small towns or from farming communities, there'd be nobody to meet them once they got off the train at, at the, the station, right? The, the Red Cross, for example, and other volunteer service agencies would have looked out for the war brides and the children by, for example, calling calling ahead, letting the family, and of course the Canadian servicemen, the husband, to let them know that the wife and the child were on their way to come pick them up at the train station. And in some cases, of course, nobody showed up. And so oh. they were stuck. In other cases, they, uh, they rejoined their family and there were cultural or linguistic differences. They couldn't mm -hmm. understand French or they had married into an Italian Canadian uh, community or into an Italian Canadian family. And so that sort of cultural exchange took times, uh, took time. And sometimes it just didn't work out. Uh, of course, you had marriages um, in, the, in the United Kingdom and of course in continental Europe where you had Catholics marrying Protestants. And that was a big concern for the Department of National Defense because they saw, especially in, in the, the mid to late 1940s, Marrying somebody outside of your religious dom domination was usually a pretty good indication that although the the marriage might might work out, there would be some some difficulties in the early years. And so they kind of tried to persuade their um, their servicemen to marry within their their sort of economic background and their religious do dom denomination. Now that didn't always preclude them from marrying whoever they wanted, right. but you do have instances when they arrive in Canada and realize that the the family that they've married into um, is just so different or has a different mentality than what they were expecting or had been told to expect. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all, so all sorts of different circumstances, um, of course, were applicable. Exactly. And of course, they came, they uh, helped to, to rebuild our country during that, uh, those post-war years, which were very, very difficult times for people. And uh, they, their contribution to our country um, is not to be forgotten. Now, uh, while let's talk a little bit, well, we've got you here, Jan. Yeah, and let's talk a little bit about uh, the resources available to people online there at Pier 21 in Halifax to learn more about your fantastic National Museum. Sure. So, of course, you can visit us um, at our website and you can download the Museum from Home app. And that app will let you explore what it was like to come to Canada. There are, of course, stories of quarantine during these un unprecedented, these difficult times of, of COVID-19. And you also have information and access to our Scotiabank Family History Centre. So if you're learning uh, about your own past or you want to know about an ancestor who came to Canada, and maybe what that journey was like or who that individual was, and you don't have a lot of information, 
but you're curious and you're interested, then our Scotiabank Family History Centre can definitely look into that for you and using different primary source materials. Yeah, and thank you so much for joining us today. Any last thoughts that you have there from uh, Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21? Well, it was a pleasure to speak with you today, and I hope that Canadians um, come and visit us online and they'll be able to uh, see all kinds of different immigration articles and blogs. And of course, they'll even be able to get assistance with their, their own research into their family's past. So I thank you once again, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Jan. And thank you viewers for joining us for this very important commemoration of the 75th anniversary of VE Day, the end of World War II in Europe. And we don't want to forget the sacrifice of all of our Canadian servicemen and women.